Good day. Welcome to the Sunday School presentation for the fourth Sunday in November, November 27th, 2022. I'm Fred Jeff Smith, pastor of Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I'm very happy that you chose to spend this time with us in the study of God's holy word. Our Sunday School lesson today completes the fall theme, which is entitled God's Exceptional Choice. And uh, it completes the third unit, which is entitled We Are God's Artwork. Our lesson uh, throughout the month of November has been from the book of Ephesians. Uh, and today's lesson comes from the final chapter of that book, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. It is entitled God Gives Tools for Our protection. Let's bow our heads, please, in a word of prayer. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you again that you have allowed us this opportunity to gather together virtually for the purpose of the study of your word in church school. We pray now, dear God, that you would move everything else out of our minds and out of our hearts, that we might be able to properly focus on receiving through this Bible study experience, that we might go down from this spirit this experience better than we were when we came, that we would be able to draw something that would be beneficial in our personal walk with you. On this first Sunday of Advent, dear God, we thank you for the promise of your coming, and we thank you that that coming has been fulfilled in the person of Messiah, Jesus. We ask that you would bless us through this season, that you would help us to draw nearer to you. Help us now to use this time in the wisest possible manner. In the name of your son, we ask it all. Amen. This week's lesson, as we said, uh, brings the fall theme uh, to a close. And we have been looking throughout the month of November at uh, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Uh, when you read this passage from the King James Version, it is filled with uh, hyperbole uh, designed to uh, draw one in. Uh, it talks about being fully equipped with the whole armor of God. Uh, we're using the message version of the scripture, so you might not get uh, all of the hyperbole. In fact, I, I don't say you might not get, you don't get all of the hyperbole that you get from the King James Version. If you prefer that, you can certainly read along with us from the King James Version. Uh, but the lesson uh, is not so much about the hyperbole as it is about a theological point. And the theological point that the lesson seeks to convey is that we should rely on God's protection against satanic attacks. We are saved not only for us, but also so that we can bring praise and glory to God. Satan knows this and seeks to undermine God's purpose, not by attacking God, but by attacking his servants and trying to curtail and stifle our witness. We have to recognize our complete inability to respond to these matters, to these attacks on our own, and we must seek divine aid in order to successfully do so. And that's the be all end all of what this lesson is about. It's really very direct and very uh, to the point. It can be divided into two chunks, verses 10 through 12, where we are invited to grasp the gravity of the war in which we are involved, and then verses 13 through 18, which examines the weapons that we are to use in order to uh, defeat Satan, in, in order to resist, and, and let me be clear, because we're not seeking to attack Satan. We're seeking to withstand satanic attacks. And Paul says that in order to do that, we have to use uh, weapons that are divinely uh, inspired, divinely provided, and only uh, work because we rely upon the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. I want to say that one more time. 
We are not attacking Satan. That's not our job. That's not what we should be concerned about. I know that in some churches, and that's why I want to be definite about this. I know in some churches they talk about uh, that, that, that we ought to put the devil on the run and, and, and we ought to stomp the devil out. And on. That ain't our job. In fact, if you read scripture properly, scripture tells us that Satan is already a defeated foe. Uh, so our job is not to do what God has already done. God, through Jesus Christ, has already defeated Satan. Death, hell, and the grave have been defeated. Well, well, if they have been defeated, then why do they continue to attack? Because for whatever reason, in the way that God has established his world, even though Satan is defeated, he allows Satan the opportunity opportunity to continue to roam. And so it is, it, it is our task, it is our job to resist Satan as he comes at us so that the message of the gospel is not thwarted, is not retarded, is, is not minimized, is not diluted by virtue of our spiritual weakness. We are not attacking Satan. We are withstanding satanic attacks. And Paul makes it clear how we do this. So let's look at verses 10 through 12, and then we'll look at verses 13 through 18, and we will be done for today. And that about wraps it up. God is strong, and he wants you strong. So take everything the master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to use so you will be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps, a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. Coming to faith in Christ is to be understood as entering every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. But it is also the commencement of a great struggle with Satan. Let those who would dwell on the blessings of our faith take note of the battle in which we have entered and which we must wage with Christ's strength. The church is engaged in a spiritual war, and the enemy is Satan and a host of unseen, angelic, and celestial enemies whose power vastly exceeds our own. With few exceptions, our enemies remain invisible to our eyes, but they nevertheless are real, and so is their opposition. These celestial enemies seem to have various forms, rulers, powers, world forces of this darkness, spiritual forces, for forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And we should never underestimate the power of Satan. While I'm saying that, let me also say we should never overestimate the power of Satan either. When we say don't underestimate, 1 Peter says that Satan prowls around like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. Uh, but, but when I say that we should not overestimate, let's remember that Satan can't force us to do anything that we don't willingly give our assent to doing. Satan doesn't invade us and force us to do things. Satan simply speaks to us, speaks to our weaknesses, speaks to our desires speaks to our unholy aspirations and tells us that they're okay and gives us permission to do the things that we always want to do. And that's Satan's greatest strength. And that's the war that we are in. We are in a war not so much with uh, 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 sat satanic forces that are coming to invade us. We're in a war with satanic forces that are coming to tempt us. 
That's why Satan uh, literally means tempter. That's what he does. He tempts us to do things that are uh, beyond the scope of God's desire for us. Our surrender to Christ means that he is the Lord of our lives. Therefore, our priorities have to shift to be in alignment with God's priorities. Love without limit and without restriction, forgiveness of any and all wrongs that are done to us, and serving the needs of others as being more important than our own needs. This is what Christ made the priority for his life and for his ministry, and therefore it must be our priority as well. Well, Satan steps in and tries to thwart that. Satan steps in and tries to turn us in a different direction, and in so doing, he, he serves to retard our witness for Christ in the world. Paul's focus here is on Satan, Satan's opposition to the church, but he also wants us to know that the defenses God has given us are enough to help us withstand what Satan brings against us. Satan's defeat, I'll say again, is accomplished through Jesus' passion and resurrection. Our defense against Satan is also directly tied to the gospel, truth, righteousness, the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, that, that, that's how it's described in, in the King James Version, uh, the helmet of salvation, the word of God, our deliverance from Satan's power and our defense from its subsequent attack is found in Christ. And so what Paul is simply urging us to do is to recognize that this is not something we can do on our own. This is something that we must do in collaboration with the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. There are some things that we would want you to know about this resistance against Satan as we go forward in our Christian witness. One thing you need to know is that our victory over Satan is sometimes won in what seems like our defeat and his success. When Jesus died on the cross, for example, it looked very much like Satan had won. But with his apparent defeat and Satan's apparent victory, the Savior brought about our salvation. And as it was true then, it is also true now. We must recognize that sometimes it looks like Satan is prevailing when in fact he is not. Satan's opposition Second point is to be found in that which seems natural and even human. Satan will come at us through human influences. Satan comes to us through whispers and, 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 and through his intention to get us to veer off course. I remind you that when Satan approached Jesus after his uh, fasting in the wilderness, Satan approached Jesus with, 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 with the desire, uh, with, by trying to plant seeds of desire in Jesus' heart to do things that, are, that were contrary to the will of God. You got to be hungry. Turn those stones into bread. You're so great that if you jump from the top of this building, angels will catch you before you fall. Why don't you go on and jump? Look at all the kingdoms of the world, Jesus. I will give them all to you. Each one of those was designed to appeal to Jesus' ego on one level or another. And as Satan attacked Jesus that way, Satan will also attack us in those ways. And we have to be on guard that we don't allow uh, our egotism to get in the way of our discipleship to Jesus Christ. And so Paul says that we have to be ready because this is a, a, an important battle that we are in. And it's not something uh, that, that has no consequence. You know, uh, we watch ball games. It's, it, it's getting to be the height of football season, both college and pro. And, 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 and we watch with great intensity to see if our team can prevail. And, and we cheer when we win and we 
mourn when we lose. But then five minutes after the game is over, we move on to something else because you recognize that ultimately it's, an, it's entertainment. It is of no consequence. If my team wins, great. Five minutes from now, I still have responsibilities that I have to deal with. If my team loses, I'm sad. But still, five minutes from now, I have to pick myself up because I have things that I have to do. It does not matter. But listen to how uh, Peterson translates this with regard to uh, what Paul says here in Ephesians chapter 6. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps. This is a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. That what's at stake. That's why this is so important. Not that we are going to defeat Satan because Satan is already defeated, but that we are going to resist Satan's attacks at us to deter and slow down our witness of the gospel to the world that needs to hear about the gospel. Verses 13 through 18, be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. All right, as we wrap this lesson up, I invite you to consider the weapons that Paul lists here that are at our disposal. First, he says, we have the weapon of truth. Truth refers both to the objective truth that God has revealed in his word and to the truthfulness that must characterize us as believers. We must put on the core truths of the gospel, that our salvation is achieved through no merit of ours, but solely by virtue of the substitutionary work of Jesus Christ. That's how we are, our sins are atoned for because Christ serves as our substitute. We must put on truthful behavior. We must be honest. We must be sincere. We must be humble in our service. One weapon he lists is truth. Second weapon he lists is righteousness. Righteousness is the imputed righteousness of Jesus. Our eternal life does not depend on our sinless behavior or our perfect track record. Thank God for that. But it rests in the blood of Jesus Christ and his righteousness, which is accredited to us. That's what justification means. It means that God, by his own choosing, does not look directly at us and sees our sin and therefore must respond to our sin. But God looks at us through the filter of Jesus Christ through the filter of his perfection, through the filter of his holiness, through the filter of his righteousness, through the filter of his sacrifice, through the filter of his shed blood. God chooses to look at us through Christ and in so doing, he only sees perfection because Christ is perfect. Our righteousness is not ours, it's righteousness that is imputed to us. It is righteousness that is given to us. We are justified because God has declared us righteous by the work of Jesus Christ. Third, he says, peace is our weapon. And we want you to consider a couple of aspects of peace. There is the peace that we have with God. 
Formerly, we were alienated from God because of our sin. We had no hope and we were without God in the world, Paul says in Ephesians 2 and 12. But the cross of Christ reconciles us to God so that now we have access to God. So that's the peace with God. But the gospel also brings us peace with one another. The battle against Satan is not just individual, it is corporate. Satan is trying to retard the church's witness by creating division and strife over such things as personality clashes or non-essential doctrinal fights. If Satan can keep the church at it at war with itself, in conflict with itself, in fracture with itself, then it, Satan retards our effort in spreading the gospel throughout the world, throughout our world as we go. But if we have the peace of Christ, then we not only have peace with God, but we learn how to have peace with one another. Fourth, he says that faith is a weapon. This is an active trust in God, knowing, believing, and acting upon his promises. This faith is what protects us from the various attacks that Satan will bring against us. This faith reminds us that through trial and temptation, we can trust in God to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Faith keeps us turned heavenward instead of inward. Too often, we're guilty of turning away from heaven and trying to solve our problems on our own. We, 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 we pray, we talk to God, we tell God uh, what our problem is, we ask God for his guidance and direction, and then we, 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 we close our prayer, we get up from our knees, we, we say amen, and then we spend our time trying to fix the problem that we say we have put in God's hands. But faith is trusting that what we have placed in God's hands, God will take care of. Another weapon that we have at our disposal is salvation. Salvation implies that the Christian mind is a regenerated mind. It is one where we have been disciplined to hear and heed the voice of Christ above all others. Salvation simply means deliverance. We have been delivered from something and we have been delivered to something. We've been delivered from evil. We've been delivered from hell. We have been delivered from Satan and we have been delivered to Christ. We have been delivered to eternal uh, presence with him, what we call heaven. We have been delivered into that holiness, that rest that only Christ can offer. So salvation implies that we have made a turn. We have decided to go in a different direction and that different direction leads us to that which is far better, infinitely better than what we could know on our own. Then he says that the indispensable weapons are God's word and prayer. God's word. That, now, you know, when, when, when you talk to, to, to certain clergy people, whenever it says God's word, they're thinking in terms of the canon. They're thinking in terms of the Bible. They're thinking in terms of the Old Testament, uh, ancient Hebrew scripture, and the New Testament, because that's what we call the Bible. We say that it is God's word. But I want you to expand beyond just the written word of, uh, uh, of our canon, and I want you to speak about the word that Jesus is. What does John say about Jesus? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. John says that the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. So when Paul says that the word is an indispensable weapon, I don't want you to think just in terms of the Bible, and I'm not trying to be dismissive uh, or negative toward the Bible. I'm just trying to get you to see that the, the word is Christ. Christ is the living word. 
And therefore, our model is to be Christ. Our model is to do the most loving thing according to, has, to, to how Jesus has taught us. Too often we spend time trying to memorize scripture and we don't spend enough time trying to model Christ. Don't just memorize scripture. Model Christ. Love like Christ loved. Forgive like Christ forgave. Serve like Christ served. Champion the needs of the least, the lost, the left out as Christ championed those needs. And when we do that, we are standing upon the word. And he says, right along with the word as an indispensable weapon is prayer. And why is that important? Because prayer is our communication link with God. Prayer is our talking to God and our allowing God to talk to us. And whenever we talk about this, I like to make the point, we don't talk to God with the intent of changing God's mind. We talk to God with the intent of lining up our thinking with God's thinking. Not my will, but your will be done. Most powerful prayer that Jesus prayed, not my will, but your will be done. Lord, may they be one in us, Jesus prayed on the way to the cross. May they be one in us as you and I are one. Let them be one in us. So the purpose of prayer is to align our will, align our desire with the will and the desire of our heavenly Father and Christ. And when we do that, we have powerful weapons at our disposal to withstand the wiles, the temptations of Satan. I say again, it is not our job. It is not what God expects us to do to defeat Satan. And don't let anybody tell you that your job is to put Satan on the run. Satan is already defeated. Our job is to withstand the, the wiles uh, and, and the temptations that Satan brings our way because that is Satan's way of trying to thwart, retard, to dilute the power of the gospel, the efficacy of the gospel as it spreads throughout the the world. God gives us tools for our protection because God recognizes that we can't withstand satanic forces on our own. So it is incumbent upon us to learn how to use the tools that are at our disposal. But in order to use a tool rightly, you have to know what the tool is used for. You don't use a hammer in order to screw in a screw. And you don't use a screwdriver in order to hammer a nail. You have to make sure that you have the right tools in order to accomplish the right task. And so you have to forfeit human tools. You have to forfeit human ingenuity. You have to forfeit human thinking and you have to align yourself with the thinking of almighty God. There's a hymn that says, thou my everlasting portion, more than friend and life to me. All along this Christian journey, Savior, let me walk with thee. Close to thee, close to thee all along this pilgrim journey savior let me walk close to thee that should be our desire to get closer to god so that we can have at our disposal the spiritual tools necessary to withstand the wiles of the devil lord god thank you for this time of sharing Thank you for a word that reassures us that you are our protection and that you have provided us with that which is necessary to put Satan off and to draw closer to you. Bless us throughout this day. Thank you for the morning worship. Thank you for the worship that is about to come. Keep us ever in your protective care in this season of Advent. In the name of your son, we ask it all. Amen. Please come by and share with us in our worship at 11 o'clock a.m. We'll be glad to see you. God bless you.